yesterday, and we kind of moved past it. I'm not going to give you a lot on this, but there's a few cases I think that a little background doesn't hurt to get. Uh, if you read that chapter, if you read the, the two chapters that you're supposed to read, neither of them are exceptionally long. Um, I reread that the civil rights chapter last night. Really, it, it didn't take much more than about 20 minutes to read. And you're probably faster readers than I am. But it, it's not a long chapter. Now, if you reread some things because they're kind of important, it may take you a little longer. Um, both of these chapters, they kind of just touch on stuff. They don't get to in huge detail. Civil rights a little bit more than the civil liberties one. But everything that we cover in here, most of the stuff that we cover, are going to be covered in that civil liberties chapter. Uh, so uh, I really suggest you read it because I think it's helpful sometimes to to hear it from two different ways, to read it and then and, and, and maybe hear about it. The TLO case, I, I just want to briefly talk about this one. Uh, it's a student search case. Um, for most of our history, students didn't have really many constitutional rights. At least when you were in school, you did not. Um, I can't remember the term. I probably have it on here. I, I can't remember. But it's a... Uh, um, it means in lieu of the parents. Uh, w when you're in school, your parents, the school is basically your parents. Um, and they play somewhat of that role, but especially if you think of a young kid. Uh, what do your parents provide for you when they're at home? Well, probably some guidance, some discipline, safety, um, food, bathrooms, those kind of things, rules. Well, if you're a, a, a second grader in school, that same role is being provided by the school. Okay. So that, that, that concept is something that goes, is a concept that we use in, in, in the American education system. When it comes to searches, there's something known as a consent search. Like, police can't search you unless they have probable cause. But that's, if you give consent, they don't need probable cause. So if a police officer comes up to you and says, can I search your car? And you say yes, even if they didn't have probable cause, the search of your vehicle is okay because you gave consent. When it comes to consent, Parents can give consent to have their minor children search. So if you're 17 and you're, the police want to search you and they ask, can we search you, and you refuse to give consent, and they call up your parents and they say yes, search them, then they can be searched. It changes when you turn 18, and there's more stuff to consent that I don't want to get into today because it, it's, it's actually more complicated. But for today, you need to know that your parents can give consent to have you searched if you're under the age of 18. Okay, now with that same concept, when people are at school, then the schools never felt any need to have probable cause to search students. If a parent can give consent to search a student, and the school, while you're in school, is playing the role of your parent, then they wouldn't need consent. Well, this came across this this concept went before the U.S. Supreme Court in the TLO case. In the TLO case, this is obviously the the girl's initial. There was two girls that were smoking in a bathroom in a New Jersey. Um, school. And a teacher walked in and caught them smoking uh, and, and took them down to the office. And the first girl admitted to smoking uh, to the principal. The principal had the unfortunate name of Mr. Chaplin was his name. Um, anyway, the, the first girl admitted to smoking and I think she was given three days out of school suspension, which was what the school board had sat down as a punishment there. The second girl, this girl named with her initials of TLO, denied that she was smoking at all in the school. She said, I wasn't smoking. Um, so the principal took her into the office. So the principal took her into the office, and he was sitting at one side, and she was sitting at the other, and her purse was right on top. Anybody got a small bag I can use? That's too big of a bag. That thin pencil bag would work even fine. That'll be perfect. Okay, so let's just say, anything, anything illegal in there? <laughs> So let's say her purse was sitting right there between the two. And, and Choplick, she denied smoking. So Choplick takes her purse and opens it up. And when he opens it up, he looks in, and right on top were cigarettes. You know, uh, 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 some Marlboro Reds or whatever she was smoking on that day. Um, so <laughs> right there, they found her cigarettes. And he basically said, you lying little, or whatever, I don't know what he said. He accused, of, he accused her of lying, but then he looked down again. And when he looked down again, he saw some other stuff. He found a, a bear with some, a leafy substance that turned out to be marijuana. 
Uh, she had some rolled up joints in there. She had some payo sheets in there, people who owed her money for different things. Um, so what we have here all of a sudden is this escalated from being, hey, you're smoking in school, you're going to get kicked out for three days, you know, to all of a sudden she was arrested. They called in the police. She was arrested. She was obviously selling drugs in school. Um, she was selling marijuana. So now she's being charged with this crime. Thank you. That was probably absolutely needed. Um, so she's being charged with this crime. So now remember the exclusionary rule? Any evidence obtained illegally can't be used against you in court. Okay, so her lawyers tried to use the exclusionary rule saying it was a probable cause-less search, which it was. There was no probable cause to search through the purse. There was something called reasonable suspicion, which is less of a standard. What do you think? A probable cause, a good reason to believe a crime was committed as the evidence we found. There wasn't probable cause to search the purse. It may be the reason, like, if, where do you keep your cigarettes? <laughs> she, keeps, she keeps them in her purse and her golf bag. Um, those two places. But if, you're, if you smoke, a purse is a, is, is a likely spot where you would have those. Right? So there was a hunch that her cigarettes would be in the purse, but there was no probable cause to believe. There's no articulable reason. When the teacher came in to the bathroom, they didn't see her stuffing things into her purse. They didn't see her taking a cigarette out of the purse. She could have gotten a cigarette from her friend. It may have been stashed in the bathroom. Someone who could have gave them a cigarette is there, you know, in the hallway or whatever. It's likely the cigarettes came from the purse, and it turned out that was the case, but there was no probable cause to support that. There was reasonable suspicion, and I never told you about reasonable suspicion yesterday, but, but I, I, was, I, I rethought that. Reasonable suspicion is less than probable cause, but it's more than nothing. That's maybe not a great explanation, but it's reason to investigate further, but it's not enough to search. You're walking down the street doing nothing. That's nothing. You know what I mean? That's, that's a standard that's less than reasonable suspicion. You're parked at 2.30 in the morning behind a business that's not open. That might be reasonable suspicion to investigate. What's going on here? It's not enough to search your car, but it's enough to investigate further. Reasonable suspicion, a lesser standard. And then probable cause is enough to search. In this particular case, the, the principal did not have probable cause, but the principal did have reasonable suspicion. Well, she challenged it. Uh, and the lawyers challenged it and went to court and eventually went to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that a couple things. They said that students do have Fourth Amendment rights in school. The first time they, they said, you know, they can't just search for no reason. However, they said that schools are held at a lesser standard than police are that probable cause was not required for students to be searched by school officials, but reasonable suspicion was necessary. So nothing is not acceptable. Like if I want to search through Emily's bag, I got nothing. I can't do it. But I don't need probable cause either. It's a lesser standard of reasonable suspicion. So two things from this I think is very important. Number one, it, it said that students have Fourth Amendment rights in school. But number two, it also outlined that the searches must be reasonable, not just random or for no reason at all. Now, I didn't put all this stuff down here. I mean, I did, but you can get that yourself. This is, I think, a line is very important, though. The, the court said that searches cannot be excessively intrusive in light of the student's age and sex uh, and the nature of the infraction, uh, which makes it harder to interpret. Okay, how serious is the infraction? Can a school do a search of a book bag in school? Absolutely. Can they do a search of an individual? Could they even do a strip search? And in some cases, yes, but it better be a pretty significant infraction. And in light of the age and sex of the student, well, if there's going to be any kind of strip search in school, which occasionally, not, not occasionally like in this, I've never heard of this school doing one, but occasionally you read cases where there was a strip search of some sort. A search of a male would have to be done by a male administrator or teacher. A search of a female would have to be done by a female administrator or teacher. That would, uh, you know, otherwise it would be excessively intrusive in light of the sex. Uh, the nature of the infraction is pretty important. If it's a potential, you know, a weapons threat, you know, someone's got a knife uh, hid somewhere in their body, it, it, you know, then maybe a, a more extensive search because a knife could be threatening. There was a search, um, a, a case of a, a girl uh, who was a middle schooler 
who, an eighth grader, who was thought to have had prescription drugs that she was selling. So there was illegal contraband that she was selling in school, uh, and there's some reason to believe that she did. Uh, and she was searched, and she, there was a strip search of her, and she was, uh, it was in a, it was by a female administrator in an office where it was enclosed that no one obviously else could see. And she was asked to strip down to her underwear, uh, and then to even to pull her bra and her underwear out to make sure that she wasn't hiding things within it. Um, I can't name the name of the case on top of my head. But the courts ruled on her behalf. They ruled that the school crossed the line on that particular one. However, in their opinion, they also wrote that that was just for this particular one. It was excessively intrusive in light of the nature of the infraction. And they said if it would have been harder street drugs, the search may have been okay. You know, so if it would have been meth rather than prescription ibuprofen, and that's what it was. It was a prescription strength ibuprofen uh, rather than, uh, well, maybe it was, a, no, I think it was ibuprofen, rather than was what, they, what she was selling, rather than like methamphetamines. The courts did not rule out that a strip search looking for methamphetamines would have been okay. Police need probable cause. That's a good question. There's another case that's similar, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but there was a case where there was, um, uh, th there's, it was a PE class, and they had their book bags out in this hallway. And there was really no access to that hallway other than the PE class. And a student, after they went back to locker rooms or whatever, came out and said, hey, I had, uh, it was like 70 bucks or something in a, a backpack there, and somebody took it. And they, and they called in the police on this, and the police said, we really don't have probable cause on this. They said, but you have a lesser standard, so school, why don't you search them? So the girls were taken in the girls' locker room, the boys in the boys' locker room, uh, and I don't think they ever found the money. But the police knew they didn't have probable cause. Now, in that particular case, the search was deemed to be illegal because even though it was conducted by a school official, the school told, the, the, the police said search. So essentially it was a police search. But there may be times when there's not enough probable cause, but there may be enough reasonable suspicion. Yeah. They do a strip search? <laughs> okay. Uh, in this particular case, a strip search, well, it was a strip search. Uh, I like light. Does the uh, probable cause Police officer is still a police officer. That's his primary primary job. Okay. Okay, let's move on then. We did double jeopardy yesterday. Okay, that's one I just don't think they're going to talk about much. Witness against yourself is... And we talked about coercion yesterday, correct? Did we do the home Miranda case yesterday? Yes. Okay. Uh, so the question. Okay. All right. So let's let's quickly review this. The Fifth Amendment. And okay, there's way too many side conversations. Okay. Uh, there's the Fifth Amendment protects us against being a witness against ourselves for self-incrimination. Uh, and like I said yesterday, you can certainly say anything you want to the police. And that's, that's okay. That can be used against you. But you have a right not to. Okay? Um, and if that confession was coerced out of you, was beaten, threatened, tortured, there's, lot, there's different ways to coerce it, then it's illegally obtained evidence. All right. Uh, in the Miranda case, Ernesto Miranda uh, raped and kidnapped this girl, confessed to the crime after being questioned for a couple hours, but wasn't, there was no really coercive tactics used against him. Uh, and, and he was convicted and, his, and it was used. I, I, I mentioned all that. Uh, and he challenged to the courts, and their challenge was that he didn't know that he didn't have to talk. And by not knowing he didn't have to talk, they said that that was akin to a, a coercion. And surprisingly enough, the Supreme Court agreed with them. They said that it, custodial interrogations are inherently coercive. That's, a word out of those, that's their line out of the, the majority opinion. Uh, custodial interrogations are inherently coercive. Okay, so in custody and being questioned are by their very nature coercion, unless you know that you don't have to speak. And then the, the Supreme Court actually wrote the Miranda rights. If you've seen the Miranda rights or heard them or had them read to you, possible, 
um, that you know you are, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be can and will be used against you. Now the second part, you have the right to an attorney, was from a a, a case called Gideon versus Wainwright, which we'll get to today too. Another very important criminal justice case. Um, probably more important than Miranda, but both of them are, are equally important. Both came out in the 60s. Um, so this, the Gideon case came out first, even though we're going to talk about it second. Miranda came out uh, a couple years later. When, they, when the Supreme Court wrote the Miranda rights, they included aspects of both of those two cases. Okay? But the key is custody and interrogation. And I know that's where we got to yesterday, but that's something that, it, that, that is important and we understand. If you are in custody and being questioned, your Miranda rights are required. Okay, both of those things got to be present. I had a lawyer once came in, and, and she used this this formula, and I've used it ever since. Both of these things must be present for the Miranda to be required. Meaning that if if you're in custody, let's say you're arrested and handcuffed back in the police car, you're in custody, but nobody's asking you any questions, and you just confess to a crime, your Miranda rights were not required because both elements were not present. Oftentimes it's the other way around, where you're being questioned but you're not in custody. Sometimes it becomes like, is being detained the same as being in custody? Meaning that, well, there was a case that happened, you may be familiar with it, because it was one of our former students here. I got into a car accident a, few, a couple years ago, uh, was texting while driving, and ran into somebody um, and actually killed them. Um, when the police showed up, there was nobody in the car itself. The, the driver of the car wasn't in the car. He was out of the car. Uh, so they were questioning people, and you can't just leave. It's seeing the crime, even if you're a witness, they may say, hey, stay here. We need to talk to you to find out what goes on. Okay, so in this particular person, he wasn't in custody, meaning he wasn't arrested, but he couldn't leave either, which is not, technically, it's not the same as custody, though it's it kind of like splitting hairs, but it's called detained. Um, so he was detained, and while detained, he made some comments like, I was texting, I didn't know what was going on, something, I don't know the exact word, but something like that. Okay, so then eventually he's arrested, and then they, prior to the trial, they're trying to get that, those statements suppressed, because his Miranda rights were not read to him. The police were asking him questions. What went on here? What did you see? He couldn't leave, but they, they deemed that he wasn't in custody. If he would have been in custody and questioned, then his statements, you know, whatever he said, I was texting while this happened, which is pretty big evidence against him if you're trying to show that, you know, you were texting and driving, um, would not have been usable in court. It doesn't mean that you're innocent, though, and I mentioned this yesterday. All it means is what you say can't be used against you. That testimonial evidence becomes illegally obtained. Not all evidence. And that's a major misconception that I see with kids, especially in my law class. I get people who say this all the time, like, hey, one of my buddies was arrested over the weekend. They didn't read him his rights. He's free, right? We got him. Technicality. Absolutely not. Police are not required to read the Miranda rights. They might lose what he says, but not necessarily anything else. And that's only if both of these things are present. Okay? Uh, Miranda was retried, and it's not double jeopardy because... The first trial ended in a mistrial. I mean, he was convicted, but it was declared a mistrial by the courts later, and convicted a second time um, without that. And then a little irony about Miranda, which I find interesting, is Miranda eventually got out of prison. Uh, for a while, he made a little bit of money by signing autographed Miranda <coughs> cards, like Miranda, those things. Uh, he eventually found himself in and out of prison a little bit, uh, but he died in a, in a fight in a bar. He was gambling in a bar. He got knifed in a bar and died. The person who was arrested for that, after being read his Miranda rights, decided not to talk to the police. And he was eventually released, and that guy fled the country, went to Mexico, and was never arrested again. So Miranda's killer was quiet, decided not to speak to the police after his Miranda rights were read to him. <laughs> it's a famous case. He couldn't get past that. Historical case. We're studying it. <laughs> Some people do. Good. Because it originated from the court case. Miranda versus Arizona. Okay. 
<laughs> you're right. You're right. It is a kidnapper and a rapist. It is a big name case. However, all right, I, I can understand that. All right, due process. This is an important concept that you understand. I mentioned this yesterday. So if the they did use that, but that they didn't just use that. So if you're the jury and you got this off, you hear the witness's testimony, the victim's testimony that identifies him. You hear the other witnesses that say he drives this, but you also hear his confession. You've heard it all. You can't differentiate like, oh, I would have found him guilty without this. Right? So they needed a new trial with a new jury without that evidence that was illegally obtained. Because otherwise, how do you know that the person didn't base your decision based on the confession? No. 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 You just, it's, it's evidence that was not legally obtained, so the jury does not ever get to even know about it or hear about it. All right. Nor deprived of due process or nor deprived of life, liberty, or pro property without due process of law. Now this you'll see again in the 14th Amendment. This is a very important kind of line here. Uh, nor deprived of life, liberty, or property. You can be deprived of all of those things. Anybody who's been executed in the United States has been deprived of their life. Anybody who's sitting in jail or prison right now is being deprived of their freedom, of their liberty. If you had to pay a fine, you've been deprived of your property. Right? You can be deprived of all of these, these things. So the key thing is then, due process of law. That, you can't be denied those things without due process. Now, there's two definitions of due process. There's substantive due process and procedural due process. Most of the time we deal with procedural due process. But actually, when the civil rights stuff is a lot of substantive due process. What we mean by procedural due process is, well, this is procedural due process. And you probably should put both of those. I don't have them here. But the, the, the word procedural and substantive. Procedural due process means that the government must follow all the rules that are established by law. Some of those rules are within the Constitution, a grand jury indictment. If we don't give you a grand jury indictment, if you weren't indicted by a grand jury, uh, you were just indicted by a judge and then later convicted, your due process was violated because we skipped an integral step. Okay? Some of those steps have been created through legislation. Some of those steps are created within the Constitution. Nonetheless, those steps have to be followed. And if they're followed and you're convicted, you had your day in court, so to speak, then you can be punished for it. But, or if you waive those steps, which you can. You have the right to a jury trial, but you may say, I'm just going to plead guilty to this. Well, essentially, you waived some of your due process, and that's your right to do so too. Judge Roll is kind of like an official... In a, in like a basketball game or, or whatever, just to make sure that all the rules are being followed, that a fair trial occurs, that everything happens that's supposed to happen. They don't determine guilt or innocence. Now, they also make a lot of rulings on suppression. If Was this evidence obtained legally or not? They make those rulings early on, what evidence is allowed to be in court, what's relevant, and, and then they'll sentence too. But when it comes to determining guilt or innocence, they don't do that. Unless you waive the right to a jury trial and want a bench trial, and a bench trial is, hey, I just want the judge to determine if I'm guilty. <coughs> Substantive due process means that the laws themselves must treat people equally. Meaning that there can't be two sets of laws. Hey, we're going to have, I think I told you yesterday that if I wanted to kick somebody out of class, who do I want to kick out? Say, okay, let's say that the rules, let's say that there's five steps. I'm not even going to listen, but let's say there's five steps that have to be followed before I can kick Chase out of class. And let's say I want to kick Ashley out of class, but it, because she's a girl, there's only two steps. She screws around once, boom, she's gone. That's, that would be, on your part, it would be beneficial to have more steps, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm it's a good thing for us to make quick Four women. Okay, all right. I understand. Um, <laughs> Now, technically, you're not violating procedural due process because you're following the steps created by law. But those, law, those steps are not treating people in society equally, so it's a violation of substantive due process, not procedural. Sometimes when you look at the, the civil rights movement, a, a lot of African Americans who were convicted of crimes had jury trials. 
They just had completely unfair jury trial. Okay, they had jury trials with all white jurors. They had jury trials where, uh, you know, there's a couple cases where the killers, I can't remember the two guys, I can still see their face, so they smirked um, when they were found not guilty of killing this guy and then walked out uh, and said, yeah, well, we did it. Um, and admitted to it. Everyone knew they did it. But they had a trial. They said, well, your due process was given. Yeah, procedural due process was followed, but substantive due process was not. The, tr the laws, the rules weren't treating society equally. So sometimes you'll see a substantive due process um, allegation more than procedural. This is procedural. This is substantive. Okay, now the last thing in the Fifth Amendment is the only one that has nothing to do with criminal law. Uh, and, and it says that, um, well, it's, you can look at it, but nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Now, this is often referred to as eminent domain because the government has eminent domain out of all the land uh, within the country. Or the, the country, I guess the government does. Meaning that even though you own a house, the government really owns it. If they want to take it from you, they can. The property within the United States is essentially under the domain of the United States itself. <clears throat> okay, so it doesn't protect you from the government ever taking the property. Those things happen. What it does is it protects you from the government taking the property for no good reason. This, what it's saying here is, nor shall the private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So there's two things that are kind of important. Public use, just compensation, which means if the government wants to take your land, they can, but it has to be for. Now, I'm going to change the word public use here in a second. But as the Constitution says, public use. Now, what's public use? Uh, obviously, roads are public use. You know, and that's where we see a lot of eminent domain cases. We want to expand, expand the, the interstate. You don't want to sell your land. It can be taken from you. Okay? Expansion of airports, uh, things like that, hospitals, um, railroads. There's a lot of eminent domain stuff with railroads. Even though it may not be a passenger railroad, Public use is shipping of goods. It's still the public use. Justly compensated means you'd be able to be paid whatever it's worth. So whatever the fair market value of that land is, you have to be paid that. You don't have to be paid more, but you can't be paid less. So it doesn't prevent you. The Constitution doesn't say that the government can't take your land. But it says it's got to be for the public use and you've got to be fairly paid for. Okay, and that's the protection it gives us. Now, one of the more controversial cases that have been recent in the Supreme Court is the Kello case. And what the Kello case was um, is the, the city of, of New London, Connecticut, I think it was Connecticut, um, they're taking land and selling it, they're taking land from you and selling it to another private person, business, who were building better houses, nicer stuff. And what was it doing? Well, it was increasing the tax <coughs> revenue, right? The, 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 if your house is valued at $20,000 and your house is valued at $250,000, <coughs> you pay taxes based on the value of your land. So the city is getting more tax revenue from you than you. So they were taking these houses that were not dilapidated. Sometimes you see this where you got like dilapidated houses that, that are just falling apart. Uh, and sometimes we have takings there, but in this case, they were older houses, but they weren't dilapidated. Nonetheless, uh, the city of New London was taking them and selling them, again, uh, selling the land to private developers who were creating nicer stuff. So they were taking it not for the public use, but for the public good, is what they were saying. And the Supreme Court, and I believe it was a 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court ruled that that was constitutional. So even though the Constitution says public use, I think the Kello case makes us look at it. Apparently, it's just the public good. Now, this upset a lot of people, including a lot of states. And uh, what happened with a lot of states is, is they passed more strict takings laws. And because the takings are almost always, almost always done by the state governments rather than the federal government, a, a number of states made it harder to take land based on their state con constitution, which is a good example of federalism <coughs> working maybe the way it should, that they can make their rights more strict than the federal government makes them. Okay, that's the eminent domain aspect of it. The Sixth Amendment is 100% on the rights of the accused. And most of the stuff in the Sixth Amendment is really easy to cover. 
uh, it's almost self-explanatory. You have the Sixth Amendment in front of you on that sheet. You can read through it, but we'll just break it down into some of them. A speedy trial, public trial, and local trial. Okay, those are all three things that are guaranteed. Okay, so we're talking about a trial to determine guilt or innocence. What we mean by speedy as means that you can't be held for a long period of time. From the time of your arrest until the time your trial begins must be a relatively short amount of time. Okay, there's a federal law that says it's a speedy trial act, and I believe it's 100 days, but I'm not 100% sure I'm correct on that. It might be 90 days. But either way, your trial must begin within, we'll say, approximately three months. Speedy doesn't mean it's the next day, but it also can't mean years from now. You can't be forced to sit in, in jail. Let's say you can't afford a bail or you're denied bail. Sit there for six years waiting for your trial. Now, this is the second time that this is addressed in the Constitution. The first time is habeas corpus. The Supreme Court said uh, the writ of habeas corpus cannot be suspended except in times of, of invasion or rebellion. And habeas corpus protects us from being held without a trial. Now, within the United States, you can't. If we keep you in a prison camp in Cuba, maybe we can hold you indefinitely. You have to be released. Doesn't mean you're innocent because you haven't been tried, but you have to be released. Okay, charges have to be dropped and they have to start the procedure again. Okay. Public trial just simply means it's open to the public. That's all it means. If you want to go watch court, go watch court. You can't be denied. You can be denied in, in juvenile court and stuff, but adult court, you can't be denied in that. Why? Because we want our court system to be watched. If it's open to the public, then we got eyes on it. If it's behind closed doors, if the court system wants to become corrupt, it's a lot easier to do it in secrecy. If it's open to the public, that means open to the public, that we can watch them, that we can hold them accountable. You have to get permission, typically, from the people involved. A local trial simply means that you're going to be tried wherever the crime co committed. So if it's a state crime and you commit a crime in Minnehaha County, you will be tried in Minnehaha County. This is not a majorly important one, but it did originate from what Great Britain was doing when we were colonists. People who were violating some of the tax laws in the county were being taken back to Great Britain to be tried for those offenses. And we didn't like that. So, you know, having a local trial became important. We should be tried where the crime occurs. They're not hard to understand what those rights are. An impartial jury means an unbiased jury. The jury that is going to determine if you're guilty or, in, guilty or innocent, and this is a pettit jury they were talking about, though the same applies for a grand jury, should be impartial which means that they shouldn't know you, they shouldn't know the details of the case, you know, um, that they should be essentially a blank slate. And there is a process of choosing an impartial jury. There has to be. It's not written in the Constitution what that process is. It's called a voir dire. I'm not going to go through it with you because the, the AP will not ask that. But there is a process. I think it's important that you know that your right to an impartial jury is, is in the Constitution. Sixth Amendment says that you also must be informed of your charges. Again, pretty self-explanatory. You're not going to go to court and say, okay, we get, here's, here's some secret charges against you. You have to be informed of the charges. You've got to know what you're being charged with. When you are indicted, you know. You know. When the grand jury hands down indictments, it's not a secret. You're told. You have the right to confront witnesses against you, okay, meaning that there's no such thing as a secret witness. Hey, we get the secret witness, but we can't tell you who they are. Nope, your Constitution gives you the right to confront those witnesses and to confront them in open court, uh, meaning that, that, that anybody who testifies against you, you or your lawyers, have the right to cross-examine that witness. Um, I'll briefly tell you about the Coy case. Some of you in the law class are familiar with it because I, I, I use that case in my law class too. Uh, but there's these two girls who are in Iowa who were sleeping out in a tent one night and they were sexually assaulted by somebody. Somebody came into their tent uh, and, and sexually assaulted these girls. They arrested the next door neighbor, a man named John Avery Coy, for this, this offense. Um, it, and it was dark. It was actually a, a picnic table or a, a, some kind of table, ping pong table with, with blankets over top of it. It was serving as a tent, so it wasn't a traditional tent. Uh, and it was very dark within that tent. And they didn't get a great look at the perpetrator. He had a flashlight. If they looked up, he looked up at, if they looked up at him, he shined a flashlight in her eyes. He told them not to look uh, at him. So they, they could describe him somewhat, but they couldn't describe him tremendously. 
Either way, enough to arrest John Avery Coy. Uh, so John Avery Coy was arrested for these, the, these, these crimes and tried. And because the girls, they were 14, they did not want anybody to know who they were. Um, they put a screen up in front of the girl. They were in the courtroom, but they put a screen up. They were behind the screen, and, and they gave their testimony. And John Avery Coy's lawyers were able to cross-examine these girls. Uh, and, they were, and John Avery Coy was convicted for this crime. But he challenged it, and it went to the U.S. Supreme Court. I think in 85, but it might have been in 89. It's Coy versus Iowa, and I'm pretty sure I put it on your, your list of cases. In Coy versus Iowa, Coy argued, or his lawyers argued, that his right of self or his right to confront a witness was violated because he didn't get to actually see the witnesses. And the Supreme Court agreed. They said the phrase, look me in the eye when you say that, means something in the court of law. I mean, without seeing them, they could have been some other people just sitting back there making these statements. Do you know that they're actually even the witness? Uh, might they be somebody who has uh, uh, some kind of beef against them for whatever reason? So you have the right, literally, the face-to-face -face confrontation of your witness. John Avery Coy's conviction was thrown out because the girls did not want to testify, even though they could have been made to testify. By this time, they were freshmen in college. Uh, they did not want to testify against him. The government could have forced them to, but decided not to. Um, and without their testimony, they couldn't get a conviction. John Avery Coy was never retried for that, most likely. Um, but either way. Compulsory process is your right to force witnesses to testify in court. Uh, it's carried out with a subpoena, but you have the right to force people, even if they don't want to be there. So let's say that a crime occurs and uh, Ashley witnesses it, but she doesn't want to testify in court for whatever reason. She's, she just doesn't want to take the time to testify. You can be forced to testify in court. The only person who can't be forced to testify is the defendant. So unwilling witnesses can be forced. They can be subpoenaed, which is a court order to show up. If you defy a court order, uh, you're in violation of the law. Bail for that. Uh, but you have the right. Basically what we want is the Sixth Amendment is saying we want... The uh, due process we talked about in the Fifth Amendment, we want a fair trial. We want everything to go before the, the jury. You know, we want a fair, impartial jury. We want the trial to happen relatively quickly after the crime was committed. One thing that does is also keep witnesses fresh. We want to make sure that anybody that saw anything, um, you know, can testify there. Um, and, and that's what the Sixth Amendment is trying to get across. Now, the last part of the Sixth <laughs> Amendment, or I, I think it's the last one, or am I skipping one? Nope, that's the last one. I think it is. It's the assistance of counsel. That you have the right to an attorney. Now the Fifth Amendment, or Sixth Amendment, says that we have the right of counsel in a criminal prosecution. It doesn't say that if we can't afford one, that one is provided for us. That's not what the Constitution said. It just says that we have the right to have a lawyer. So most of our history then, you had the right, if you couldn't afford one, then you didn't have one. It's kind of like I guess you have the right to a car. It's not a constitutional right, but you have that right to a car, I guess. But if you can't afford one, you just don't get one. The government doesn't provide you with one. And that's pretty much how things win here. You had the right to an attorney. You couldn't afford one. I guess you're just out of luck. Well, uh, that was challenged in a very important case called Gideon versus Wainwright. Earl Gideon uh, was kind of a small-time drifter. Uh, he was uh, accused of breaking into a, a pool hall in Panama City, Florida. It was uh, closed for the night. Um, he was accused of going in there. Uh, the, the burglary was kind of a small-time burglary. I think it was a, a cigarette machine was busted open and, and, and the change was taken out. I think a jukebox was also busted open and the change was taken out and a few beers were stolen. And anyway, a, a witness uh, pegs Gideon as doing this. Uh, so Gideon's arrested for this. And it, he says, you know what, I, I don't have any money. Um, I can't afford a lawyer, and Florida says, well, I guess you're SOL then. Um, or just defend yourself, which was, you know, the Constitution doesn't say they have to provide one. And he was convicted. And then um, Earl Gideon then himself does some research and, and files a brief himself with no lawyer to the U.S. Supreme Court. The irony, maybe he didn't need a lawyer. Maybe he was smart enough to do it himself. Um, and his brief to the U.S. Supreme Court was that, that he was denied the right to a lawyer because he couldn't afford one. And the Supreme Court agreed. Uh, in, Earl, in Gideon versus Wainwright, they, they said that a lawyer 
is a necessity, not a luxury in court. And from this point forward, the government must provide you with a lawyer if you can't afford one. Now, we know we have a public defender's office in the United States, the United States and every county. Why? Because of this case right here. Prior to that, there wasn't. But this court, this case said there must be. Now, the Gideon case, remember the, your rights, your, your Miranda rights, have the right to remain silent. And it also says that if you can't afford a lawyer, that's these two cases that were combined together. Gideon and Miranda are both very important cases, in, at least when it comes to these two amendments, because they, they really changed our criminal justice system. You know, they, they made dramatic changes within them. A, uh, so an important case there. The seventh, any questions on that? No. Actually, Gideon was found not guilty. The, the, the guy who, um, uh, who turned him in was most likely the perpetrator. Uh, you know. Probably framed. Um... I never watched this movie, but when I first started teaching, there was another teacher, this was out in Hot Springs, that used to show the movie uh, Gideon's Trumpet, which is Paul Newman's in it. It was made like in the 1960s or early 70s. I've never seen it, but that depicts this story. So if you say, hey, you know what, I'd really like to watch a really old movie about a particular case. There you go. No. No. Moving on. Seventh Amendment. I cannot believe that you will ever be asked a question on the Seventh Amendment. The Seventh Amendment deals with civil law, not criminal law. And all it means is, is if you are being sued, that you have a right to a jury trial if you're being sued for $20 or more. Okay, that's, it. that's all it guarantees, your right to a jury trial in a civil lawsuit if, it, if it's over $20 or more. Now, that's in federal because, remember, this applies to the U.S. government, not to the states. I don't know if it's, this one's ever been selectively incorporated into the states or not. Nonetheless, I cannot believe you'll ever get a question. For what? Too complicated. But another day, I can answer. How about after the AP? After the AP tests are done, well, three days. You're not a senior, are you? See how we can cover that for three days. Eighth Amendment is a very short amendment, but there's actually a lot of stuff in it. Eighth Amendment protects us from excessive bails and fines or cruel and unusual punishment. Now, we talk about excessive bails, excessive fines. This is a word that's, that we all know what excessive means, but it's hard to define. You know what I mean? If I say I ate an excessive amount of, uh, I don't know, pizza last night, you know I ate too much. But it's, it's hard to put a definition on. Was one piece okay, but two became excessive? Was two okay, but three moved into the excessive range? You know what I mean? Uh, so when it says that fines cannot be excessive, they cannot be more than is needed. Okay, so what is a fine? what's the purpose of fines? Well, like a, a speeding ticket, a fine would be, you know, fines are high enough to get people to, to follow that law, really. It, it, you want it, if, if the fine was a buck, I'd speed all the time. I got bucks to give up, you know what I mean? But if the spine is $100, then, then maybe that's enough to get me not to speed. Does it need to be 1000 You know, and so what is excessive? Well, obviously things are going to change over time. You know, what may be acceptable today, you know, not excessive today, maybe, or, or maybe acceptable in the past. Let's try this again. Maybe an excessive in the past may no longer be excessive. I imagine in... 1790, if you were going fast on your horse and buggy and you got a $200 fine, that would be huge, or a $100 fine. Today, a $100 fine is not excessive. You know, so the, the word excessive is, is hard to define, but it also, it also gives you, it gives it the ability to, to change over time. Does that make sense? Okay, the second part is probably what we use more than anything else, and that's the cruel and unusual punishment aspect of it. What is cruel and unusual punishment? Well, when it comes to punishment, it's, it, that's hard to define, too. I guess here's what the courts gave us. Uh, they gave us once uh, that if the punishment shocks the conscience of the civilized world, then it's cruel and unusual punishment. But my interpretation of that is 
If you look at something and you say, that's not right, I feel uncomfortable with that, then that's shocking your conscience. If somebody does something, say, oh, your conscience has been shocked. Now, when we say, if it shocks the conscience of the civilized world, does Americans or in other parts of the world, what we consider our civilized world, whatever we consider that to be, would they do that same kind of punishment? So when you think of like public flogging, we're going to whip somebody in public. Now, I think most Americans would say, uh, uh, I'm not comfortable with that. Okay? That's an example of something that is shocking the conscience. So it's not allowed. It's not allowed. Now, we've got to also realize that that changes over time. An acceptable punishment in the past may, may eventually evolve into something that shocks our conscience. Does that make sense? So something that we may have, you know, whipping somebody in, in the 1700s, and I said, well, that would have been fine. Whipping somebody today, not. Nah. Okay, so it, again, that can shift too. I think probably where we see the biggest thing, will you guys stop talking, please? Thank you. I think where we see it more than anywhere else is when it comes to the death penalty. The death penalty is not unconstitutional. The Supreme Court ruled in Furman versus Georgia, which is probably the biggest Supreme Court case on the death penalty, is they affirmed that the death penalty itself is not cruel and unusual punishment. However, the Supreme Court has given us a number of rulings about different things. You can't execute anybody for anything except for first degree murder. Um, not all forms of execution is okay. You can't execute juvenile. You can't execute the mentally ill. You can't execute somebody uh, um, who is, uh, we don't use the term anymore, but, the, but when the courts made it, mentally retarded. Now I think we use developmentally something. I don't know the exact term, but whenever you read the case, it uses the term mental retardation because that's what it was referred to at the time. So even though the courts have ruled that the death penalty itself is okay, there are a number of pretty important death penalty cases. I would imagine it's very likely that there will be at least one case mentioned about the death penalty, the Eighth Amendment, on the, in, on the AP. I don't know which one, though. I will. I, as long as people remind me. Thank you, Robert. I have a note down that. Robert, with the crew and 